tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Here we are, huh? Right on the precipice of Drew Blood Season 2. We're so close, you can almost smell it. <laughs> oh, hey there, Chester. I thought I smelled something. What is that, anyway? Food they roadkill? Ah, no sense of humor, this guy. Come on in, friend. Oh, that's better. Say, you ever hear of the 23 Enigma? Well, back in 1960, this sailor named Captain Clark bragged he had sailed 23 years without a single accident. And that very day, his ship went down. Killed him and everyone else aboard. How's that for irony? Someone should have told that lady with her 10,000 spoons about it. <sighs> well, it feels good to have gotten past 23, that's all I'm saying. And 24 is supposed to be a lucky number. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, a word from our ethical capitalists. Ah, now let's see. Ah, a microphone. Ah, it says here, This is Season 1, Episode 24 of Drew Blood, Dark Tales. Ah, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. Uh, let's see. If you want to show support for the program, go to simplyscarypodcast.com and sign up as a patron. Ah, uh, it also says you'll get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Ah, uh, thank you. Jim Ignatowski, out. And we're on the clock. Tonight we've got two dark and dusty desert tales by author Aaron Vleck. This first one takes us out to New Mexico to dabble in a little Indian magic. So without further delay, I give you, from author Aaron Vleck, Book of Skins and Bone. Back in Hudson with my last cape of fire in my rearview mirror, I had plenty of time to stew with my own juices. I was used to running my own show, and even though I was usually on somebody else's dime, Frank Infield was nobody's patsy. First thing back at my hotel, I crawled under the covers with my old buddy Johnny Walker and his pal Do Not Disturb, and slept like the dead for three days. Got up when I woke up, showered, and made a beeline for the post office to pick up my mail. Mr. Renfield, I'll make you a deal. You go on one last little errand for me and when you return, if you choose to return, we can decide to continue our arrangement. Or I can pay you off and send you on your way. Deal. Go out west to New Mexico, a place called Las Cruces. A secluded little desert bird that can be quite charming in its way, I'm told. Once there, secure a sound vehicle, and then find Coyote, and seek his counsel. Sorry for being so cryptic, but it's in the nature of the journey, I'm afraid. And that's all it said, signed as usual, Mr. Knight. No fond farewells or anything. Just the assumption I'd jump on the next train, only finding out what I was after when I got there and made contact. See, Mr. Knight was some sort of juju man. I'd never met him, but he'd contacted me some years back through an ad I'd placed looking for detective work. No job turned down, ever. 
and since then, I'd never looked back, searching the world for things Mr. Knight wanted found. There's some damn good yarns in there over the years, but for now I was headed west. Say, fella, you believe in coyote, do you? I mean, really believe? The guy in the battered old Stetson drawled as he poured my whiskey and shoved it toward me across the bar with a stump of a hand missing a couple of fingers. It looked as if I was off and running, and I'd only been in New Mexico for a few hours. I tossed the shot back and slammed the glass down with a nod. Cause if you do, he picked up where he'd left off after pouring another. Then you know if he wants you, he just trots right up and hoists his leg and marks you as his own. He doesn't even ask if you're interested or not, or what gods you pray to or don't, or the color of your hide or who your pappy's kin are. Then again, maybe he just needed to take a piss, and you got in the way. <laughs> the guy started roaring and slapping his knee, and the other dozen or so other grizzled characters in their dusty leathers and boots joined in. I laughed too, because it was pretty funny. That must have been my price of admission, because the guy quit laughing and turned serious, staring me down. You looking for Coyote, are you? But don't bother denying it, I can always tell. The guy said, spitting something in a cup he lifted up from behind the bar. Or maybe he's already found you. Uh, looking as odd at this point, I guess. He real? A man with an address I can look up? Or a myth? Old yarn? Or what? I was winging it here. Looking for information, but keeping it light. What? The guy said, finally looking up at me. You thought Coyote was a man? Or some kind of wild dog? Or maybe just a spirit from the before times, yeah? Well, I'll tell you something, all right? Coyote, he ain't none of them things. And he's all of them rolled up with spit and glue and a whole lot more nobody will ever know about. Now you go looking for Coyote out there in his desert. You can count on one thing, son. He'll find you. And you don't need no damn address, he bellowed, and all the old timers started busting up again. <laughs> this one's on me. Now, drink up and get. The bartender snapped as he filled my glass one last time and jabbed what was left of his thumb toward the clock behind them. Closing time. I finished my drink and headed to the flop house I'd booked for the night. The guy at the desk told me about another guy down at the garage who could rent me an old Ford for a few days. When I'd picked up the keys, he'd given me the lowdown on the Ford's peculiarities and advised me to fill as many cans of gas as I could afford and she could hold, and a few more of water, or I'd be dead before I crossed half the desert between here and somewhere else. So I took his advice and at sunrise hit the road in search of Coyote whoever or whatever he was. Beyond the city limits, it was one desolate stretch of road, just flat gray earth, empty as far as the eye could see in all directions of anything but scrub and a few jackrabbits. But I was glad to be out there and figured it was good to have time to think things over. Just past sunset that first day, I spotted a pair of headlights coming up fast on my tail. For no reason, it kind of spooked me. Probably because I hadn't seen anybody on the road all day, and only a lone figure on horseback off in the distance now and then. I slowed and let them pass. Another old pickup like the one I was driving. The two guys inside looked me over hard, and then floored it, and roared on ahead as I fell back a ways to put some distance between us. A couple of hours later, I saw more headlights in my rearview mirror and without thinking I floored it, not sure if I could outrun anybody, to where I had no clue, but I felt something pricking on the back of my neck, and it said run. The lights disappeared for a while, and I slowed and drove at an easy clip, but then the headlights appeared again just as the moon started to dip. They caught up with me and pulled up alongside, and I could see it was the same pickup and the two guys again, which just wasn't possible. The grizzled old driver grinned at me like a maniac and then started hooping and hollering. 
Then they ran me off the road and my truck crashed straight into a ditch and came to a halt. The two guys, obviously rough fellas, were still grinning as they climbed out of their truck and sauntered up to me. I reached for my 38 and cursed, remembering I would stowed it in the glove compartment. I decided to let them open the bidding as my jacks or better were safely out of reach in the pickup. What do we got here? The driver and the guy in charge, I figured, said as he spit something dark and runny onto the ground. Eh, what can I do for you fellas? I'm not from around here. You got me mixed up with some other fella, maybe? Maybe not, sonny yo. You looking for Coyote? The other one said. This one was a lot younger, and I realized he was the balls and brains of the outfit, and twice as mean looking than the dumb lug who lumbered from boot to foot beside him grinning. We're looking for him too, and we got calls. Yes, sir, we do. You a pal of his or what? Looking for him? Nah, not me. Never heard of him until this morning a few miles back in Las Cruces when some jokers in a bar were telling stories about him. Mostly just making fun of me, out of town or in all, I said. He stiff you boys on some drinks or what? I added, trying to sound like I just wanted to get back on the road. Yeah, well, the young guy said absently, looking around and stretching. That don't seem right but what we know. Skink, the barkeep back at the Agua Caliente, said you was looking for Coyote. Came in asking for him by name and everything. Now, you got business with that boy the way we do, then we don't got much need for any lopers, and we'll do for you just like we will Coyote. Now, if you're his kin or his pal, then you're taking us to him. Which'll it be? The guy drew a length of rope off his belt and started towards me, while the other one pulled a huge knife out of his boot and started grunting. I just stood my ground glaring at him. There was nowhere to run and no way I could take out the both of them, disable the truck and take off in mine before they had me trussed up like a pig for the spit. So I balled up my fists and readied myself to give as good as I got, except for the knife of course. Stealing myself for the onslaught of blows and locking eyes with the young guy as he barreled headlong towards me with his pal, I didn't notice the sudden rush of wind and the blur that flew into my field of vision and grabbed the two guys and wadded them up like a bunch of old newspaper and threw them in a heap to the ground. Then the blur was gone, and everything was silent except for a sick gurgling from the mangled heap of meat that used to be the young guy and his old sidekick. The only thing missing from them was their throats. Dashing to the pickup, I grabbed my 38 and prepared to make a stand. But nothing happened. I didn't think there was anything out here in the desert big enough and fast enough to do that to two grown men, and then just disappear. So I was thinking maybe it was some Indian magic, what they call medicine around here. A thing I had absolutely no goddamn knowledge of whatsoever. I holed up in the car with my gun drawn for several minutes, but nobody else showed up, and all around it was just too quiet. I was about to get back on the road, figuring whatever had done this could find me if it wanted to when another pair of headlights came out of nowhere and then a rusty old pickup pulled off the road and the driver killed the lights and engine. Stealing myself for the next round of the scuffle, I marveled at the guy who climbed out of that truck. He was about my height, around six foot, in dusty jeans and ratty looking worn boots, and nothing but a fringe leather vest topside. His lean muscled chest tanned dark as his boots. He sported a thin three day beard, and his reddish yellow hair was done up in long braids, and he wore a beat up old black felt hat with a feather in it. I took him for an Indian at first, but Spidey screamed no. So I worked my hand magic and set my guard around me and grabbed my juju moppet in my pocket. Say, Crow, them bounty hunters friends of yourn? The stranger said, walking up to the bodies and kicking their boots. 
He couldn't possibly think they were still alive. I didn't know who he was talking to, since there was nobody else there. No, I said, looking around. Oh, don't mind me. I call everybody crow. I never laid eyes on those two before today, but they meant me harm and somebody... Something saved my keister last minute, I answered, taking my measure of the guy. Good, he said, spitting to the side. Then he did something that floored me and forced a choke out of my mouth. The stranger unzipped his jeans and pulled out his manhood, and then pissed all over the bodies while roaring with laughter. Bounty hunters, eh? Well, I'm gonna get back on the road, I said, easing my way back to the pickup. Well, you ain't going nowhere in that old heap. Her days are up. Axles broke, two flats in the front. She's done for. He said, removing his hat and putting it over his heart, and making some sign with his hand in the air. And just like that, the switch flipped from normal folks' view to Spidey's territory. There was no way this guy could have seen what was wrong with my truck in the dark. And the speed with which he moved made me shiver. Besides, you go looking for a feller, and he finds you first and saves you from a jam. You owe him a thank you and a shot of something good to drink. What you got on you? He said with a grin, his strange yellow eyes lighting up like a kid on Christmas morning. I'm guessing I'm in the company of none other than Coyote himself. That about right, I asked. And you did for these two here in some way of yours. That's about right, Crow. And you best jump in this here pickup of mine. When she fires up, she don't wait for nobody. Where are we going? I asked, climbing in the passenger side. We'll see when we get there. You ride with Coyote, you gotta take your chances. We rode for a few miles in silence except for Coyote whistling something and then mumbling under his breath. After a while, I just had to know. You said back there I was looking for you. That's right, Crow. A man always comes looking for Coyote at a certain fork in his road. Got no choice. Say, you got any booze on you? He asked a little too eagerly. Or some smokes? What? No, I got nothing on me except a change of clothes and a bedroll. I was really getting mad, thinking I'd gotten mixed up with the wrong guy. He had no finesse like the usual magical types I'd encountered along the way. But deep down I knew I'd found Coyote, whatever he was, and knew in the fullness of time, like always, the cards would all get dealt on the table. Alright, well let's camp here for the night, he said, pulling off into the dirt a ways from the road. Let me see what I can rustle up. Some grub, maybe. See if some other crow around these parts has some drink I can barter or steal. Or find somebody who owes me a favor. Plenty of them around. I pulled my duffel bag out of the back in a thin bedroll of coyotes and set up camp, such as it was. Then he built up a big fire and I settled down. Coyote jumped back in his truck and tore off without a word, leaving me staring at his taillights. I had no idea if he'd be back, if he'd gone looking for people who owed him, or what he could steal in the way of grub and booze, or if he was just having fun at my expense. So after a bit I rolled up in my blankets and fell asleep. <gasps> Something made me jerk wide awake and I sat bolt upright. Coyote's truck was back, parked by the side of the road, but he was nowhere in sight and the fire was down to nothing but a few red coals. Everything was dead quiet. I was about to go back to sleep, figuring he had just gone off somewhere to relieve himself, but then jumped in surprise when the fire roared up to a blaze and seemed to light up the whole desert. Two corpses swung by their feet from a nearby tree not twenty feet from where I'd been sleeping. There'd been no tree when we settled down for the night, and sure as hell no corpses. I could see it was the two guys who had attacked me on the road, the bounty hunters. Coyote wandered into the camp and stared at the site while scratching his backside, 
That wasn't here when we made camp. I hissed, my eyes bugging out of my head. Course not, you damn fool. You think I'd settle us down here for the night with them shades dangling there? Where'd they come from? Don't matter. What matters is we don't let a chance like this slip through our mitts. Now, since you're the greenhorn and all, I'll do right by you and let you go first. Coyote said with a bluster of pride, Go first? What do you mean? Well, at taking the damn things down, of course. Coyote barked, rolling his eyes like he was talking to an idiot. Which one do you want? Take your pick, but get on with it. We don't got all night. These things go sour on you if you take too long getting them down. You ever smell one of these things that's gone sour on you? Gone sour? What the hell are you talking about? I roared, jumping to my feet. I don't want a damn corpse. What the hell am I supposed to do with a dead man? And besides, how'd they get here? Who did this? Strung them up like this? You? Uh, you saying you don't want one of these things? Coyote grinned, his eyes narrowing a bit, and a little grin twisting the corners of his lips as he ignored my question. Hell no! Hey, you're sure and all. I'm sure as shit. Last chance. Coyote drawled. I don't want a damn corpse. I growled, feeling the bile churn in my hackles rise. I'm asking you, man, who did this to these guys? Well, alrighty then. Coyote roared, sidling up to the corpses and cutting one down where it fell to the ground with a sickening soggy thump. It was the damnedest thing I'd ever seen. Coyote turned his eyes on me and for the first time I saw how they twinkled with something ancient and a far cry from human. And I remembered what the barkeep had said. This wasn't just some rangy cowpoke who called himself Coyote. This was the real deal and I had no idea what that meant. Then he grabbed the dead man and shook him out as thin as a sheet but dark as midnight and almost invisible. Coyote carefully folded it up like an old newspaper and stuck it into his back pocket. Then he took down the other one and did the same, but before folding it up and hiding it away somewhere, he tore off a piece and started chewing on it, licking his lips and grunting with satisfaction. Then he tore off some more and shoved it in my face. I almost puked where I stood. Coyote roared with laughter and slapped his knee. You don't want none. Damn good eating jerky if you ask me. Don't know when we'll get any more like it. He said, turning away and doubling over laughing. Come on then, get your gear. We need to get back on the road by daybreak, or these fellers will come looking for what we took off them. What do you mean? What are those things? Who'll come looking for them? Crow, you gotta know a thing. Horse thieves and bounty hunters don't leave behind nothing but a shadow when they's hung. Don't you know nothing besides your own name and where to wipe? A shadow? What good's that for? Well, if you don't know, then there's no harm waiting till we need one for you to find out. Now get your gear. Coyote ordered and then set off through the scrub leaving the truck behind. We must have walked for a good two hours, Coyote bounding ahead and me lagging behind before he fell into step beside me. You hungry? Yeah, you find anything, I said, and he just threw his head back and howled. Then he bounded off toward the horizon and disappeared from sight. All I could do was stand there in shock. He came back a little while later carrying a big turtle under his arm. He sat down in the dirt and turned the turtle over, then cracked the shell gently on the belly with the handle butt of a knife he kept stuck in his belt behind his back. Coyote scooped out the live turtle and shoved it toward me, but I had no idea of what he wanted me to do. Here you go. Now swallow her quick and whole and she won't bite. Coyote said. What the? I yelled, gaping at the sight. I'm not eating that. Coyote shrugged but didn't say a word. He just opened his mouth and swallowed the turtle whole in one gulp. Why'd you kill it? We could have found something else. I demanded, beginning to regret this whole setup. 
That this was the coyote I'd been sent to find was clear, but I still had no idea what to do besides play along as best I could. But this was where I drew a line. I sat there and watched as Coyote went to work. Picking up a knot of something he called sage, he scrubbed the shell clean, then rubbed sand all over it till it was smooth and shiny. Then he shoved it into his back pocket where it disappeared without a trace despite the size of the thing. Come on, we still got a ways to go and nobody's getting any younger, Coyote said, heading back to the pickup. I'm still driving, he said, and I nodded without a word and jumped in the passenger side. The next day we were making good time down the road to nowhere when Coyote slammed on the brakes and pulled off the road, sending me almost through the windshield. Now what? I asked, rubbing a knot that was already forming on my forehead. Well, Coyote said in that long, drawn-out way of his. Now we wait, he said. Wait? Wait for what? I demanded, getting a real mad on. We're not waiting for anything. We're just waiting. That's it, I said, jumping out of the truck. I'm out of here. Suit yourself, said Coyote, shielding his eyes from the sun and grinning over at me. Then he got out of the truck and laid down against his bedroll and went back to his business of just waiting and staring off toward the horizon. I'm going, I said, meaning it more this time than the first, but still just standing there with my hands in my pockets. So you said, happy trails. All right, I'm heading back. Give me the keys. There's only one way back from here, Crow. You know that. And it sure as hell ain't in my pickup. And what would that be, damn it? I growled. I'll hitch a ride if I have to, I barked, and then remembered we hadn't seen another car on this road in a day and a half. South, not the way you come. Only one way to get anywhere from here is to head due south, he said, waving his arm and sticking a bony finger in the direction I took to be due south. He looked at me but didn't do a thing. All right then. But at least answer me something. I might, said Coyote. If I feel like it. <laughs> he added with a cackle. Okay, now, I thought you were going to teach me some stuff, I said, feeling righteous and cheated on. That is what I came looking to Coyote for, I added, glaring at him. Teach you some stuff? Huh. I look like a school marm to you. Yeah, and you haven't showed me anything. You just made me look at a bunch of weird nonsense and a whole lot more nothing. Is that a fact? That is a fact. Okay, then. What about this corpse shadow I got here in my backside? And the one I ate for lunch? Coyote asked, digging around behind him and pulling out the black shadow of the bounty hunter and dangling it in my face. You don't see some high coyote medicine in this shade? He growled through his teeth in my face. No, friend, I do not, I growled back. Well then, let me show you a thing, said Coyote. Now you look here real close like, and listen twice as hard. I crossed my arms and took a stance, but I wasn't inclined to believe much of anything at that moment. All right. I can see you don't think much of Coyote's medicine, he said, holding up the shade by the top of its head. But I ain't seen no. Before I could even get the word out, Coyote stepped into the shade and disappeared from sight. What the? I gasped. Then the shade appeared again and out stepped Coyote who folded it back up and stuffed it into his back pocket. Damn! I yelled. That's right. Damn fine coyote medicine dangling right in front of your nose, and you don't even see it coming. Now you listen to this. One of coyote's best medicines is his way of hightailing it back and forth, to and fro to anywheres he sets his mind to. And I do mean anywhere on this earth or anywhere else. You get it? I get it, I muttered. The shades are great for getting out of all sorts of jams. The strung-up bounty hunter variety, well, 
They're the best ones for a long distance travel, and they last longer than most shades. Why, I bet I get a good ten passes out of each one before I got to bury them in the dirt and wash myself clean of it. No, sir. Can't do any sort of coyote business without them shades. Why didn't you tell me? I demanded, marveling despite myself at this whole new kind of magic I'd never seen nor heard nor fathomed before. Not even with Mama Cartwright. Because you was too damned impatient. I asked you if you wanted one of them. He even said you could take first cut and grab the one you wanted. But no, you wanted nothing to do with it. So I saw no damned reason not to take both of them for myself. <laughs> he said with a chuckle. Well, is that all there is to it then? I asked, calming down and getting used to the idea of Coyote traveling through the shadows to unnamed places. Is that all there is to it? Coyote howled in his best mocking tone, <laughs> laughing so hard he had to hold on to his sides. I could feel myself turning red as a blister and had to look away. No, it ain't all. Coyote yipped. Then he sidled up real close and looked me dead in the eye. That ain't all but a long shot, he said, almost in a whisper, and this time his eyes weren't laughing. Then he sat down and pulled the turtle shell from his backside pocket. What about this? Coyote asked. You said you was hungry. Well, I was, I said, trying to contain my anger. But I don't care much for turtle cooked, much less raw, and I don't eat anything alive. What do you take me for? I take you for somebody who was hungry to learn a thing or two about the coyote medicine way. Seems I was wrong. I do, but what's some damn turtle got to do with it? Well, it's got a whole lot to do with it. I scoured those hills looking for a turtle who'd give himself up for you. None of them wanted anything to do with some silly ass from back east still green to all the way of things. But finally this old turtle woman said she hadn't got long to live, so she was happy to help Coyote out in the pinch, and for a good cause. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the coyote medicine rattle I made for myself out of one of their shells long ago in the before time. I used it to call things to me. Friends sometimes, allies mostly. Crow more often than not. The real crow. Why, a coyote even calls down the stars themselves with that rattle, and they dance with him in a sing around his bonfire on the coldest night of the year. It's like a tradition. Been going on for some while now. Long before your kind ever came. But- Now hush your yap. You ask coyote something, you keep your yap shut till he's done telling it. That was gonna be your own rattle to start learning the coyote way of calling things you need. You never see coyote carrying a sack or anything of the like, but have you ever seen him come up short of his needs? No, sir, you have not, and you can't bet the ace of spades you never will. We sat for a while on a huge rock, me just staring into space and coyote staring at me. After a while, he poked me with the toe of his boot. What? I mumbled. Ain't you gonna ask me what I'm doing now? <laughs> Asked Coyote, laughing again. I know what you're doing. And what's that? You're waiting. Just waiting. Well now, we're getting somewhere, roared Coyote. And what exactly is this waiting? Oh, how the hell do I know? Just killing time, I guess, while you figure out what to do. How do I know? Yeah, I suppose you're right, said Coyote. Then again, maybe it's like this. One of the biggest pieces of the coyote medicine way is his weights. You've heard it before, I know you have. Coyote weights. There's songs called that. And stories too, lots of them. You ever wonder why? Don't know, and don't much care at this point. Sure, you don't much care. You got better things to do. Best get out there walking. I saw Death out there nosing around and he was asking after you. But let me tell you about Coyote and his waiting around. If you have a mind to hear and you want to keep that old boy out there waiting a bit longer. 
I just nodded, certain that if I wandered out there alone, death would indeed cut my ass off. If I sit here on this rock long enough, it'll be tomorrow, or next week, or a hundred years from now. Just like you, <laughs> Coyote said with a howl of laughter. <laughs> but here's the thing. Coyote waits a whole lot faster than you do. So a hundred years of coyote time ain't the same as your time. I sit here like this for an hour, if I have a mind to, and it'll be ten years or more gone by. That's the waiting forward part. But then there's the waiting backwards part of the thing, where if coyote waits long enough, it's yesterday. Or last week. Or a hundred years ago. Or even the before times. Well now that's something. I admitted, finally taking an interest in where this could be going and how it might be useful to me in my dealings with things in my line. Coyote waits sideways, too. Not only between now and then, but between here and there. There is any place at all outside the world that's any place at all except here. If I hanker to go there, hell, it don't even have to be a real place. I just up and go. You get my drift. Coyote had one eye arching towards me like he was hoping I'd say something that wasn't just plain stupid. I got it. So the way I see it, that's three kinds of coyote medicine you got no damn use for. So there's nothing left for you now except to head south. You'd best get on your way. Nightfall is no kind of place for a guy with no medicine said Coyote as he shook his head and then closed his eyes and went to sleep. And that little rag doll in your pocket? It ain't no good out here, he added, without opening an eye. I just sat there, not even sure what to do. I could head back south, but I'd never been much good at south. South would mean admitting I'd come up empty-handed. I could wake Coyote now, but it'd just be more of the same. So I waited until he was snoring like a tornado. Then I rifled through his pockets and pulled out the shade. I let it flap in the breeze a bit. Then I stepped inside. <laughs> Behind me, I could hear Coyote tossing in his sleep, laughing. There was nothing here but the night sky above and below and all around as far as I could see. And it was filled with stars. And the sound of Coyote laughing at me. Before long, the mad wore off, and I started laughing at myself, too, knowing nothing at all mattered except the coyote medicine, the juju, the hoo-ha, the magic, and all the stuff I was steeped in up to my eyeballs and past the gills to either swim in like a champ or drown laughing. Sometime later, when I was back inside myself again, Coyote came up to me and looked me in the eyes. Well, I suppose you're ready to learn a thing or two now, he said. I went all cold inside, even after everything I'd seen so far. He stepped around behind me and grabbed a hold of my hair while pulling the big buck knife out of his belt. I could hear the sound of him ripping the back of my shirt open. I went stiff when he pinched a handful of skin on my neck and pulled it tight like I'd seen Mama Cartwright do to a rabbit. I saw the stars again when he cut into me, when he sliced open the skin down my back from my neck to my butt. He was pulling it off me, slow and careful, skinning me alive right where I stood and there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. I just looked up into the sky as the sun melted like golden tears over the mountains and all the stars came back one by one. Next thing I knew, Coyote was sitting around the fire grinning at me, and I was looking back at him with some kind of new eyes. He was cutting my skin up into pages and sewing them into a book, and then he stuck that book in his pocket too. He was polishing up my spine bones and throwing them down, scattering them all around, waving his hand over them and telling futures with them in tall tales. I saw he had my leg bones too, 
He'd made a rain stick out of one of them, and the drum beat with the other, and painted them all over with signs and portents. There was a big crow sitting on his shoulder now, and I wondered if it was somebody I knew. Then figured probably not. Without a thought, I dropped down onto my all fours and bounded off into the night to count the stars in the far black sky and to sing them my very own medicine song. That's how it all happened. It was a long, long time ago now. Not sure how long exactly. Maybe three days, maybe four. Maybe as much as a week. With Coyote, you didn't have to pretend anything, least of all, even to be human. It's all about the magic with him and nothing else, except the book Coyote made out of my own hide while I let him do it to me, and the fact nobody will ever read what's written down there except me. I had the shade folded up in my back pocket, and how I could still get seven or eight good passes out of it. I had the rain stick too, and the drum beater that had been my legs, and the telling bones that was my spine. I think once or twice I even smiled at the remembering. You see, when Coyote laughs and dances you up and down under the stars, and he won't quit till his side split open, and you think he's going to pee himself, and death is out there somewhere asking after you, you better dance with him. Because heading south is just no way for a man, a magic man, a juju man, a man born to strange medicines, to live. Talk about a shady character. That was Book of Skins and Bone by Aaron Vleck. See, once you venture into uncharted territory, you're going to be taking your chances. You might even need to take your medicine. Careful with juju shit is all I'm saying. For our second story, Sheriff Roy Varick has no room in his jail for a hardened mass murderer who won't confess. So he takes him out deep into the desert and leaves him in the care of old Jacob, a man who lives on his own a million miles from nowhere. Again. From author Aaron Vleck, I give you Making Ends Meet. I just got done sweeping the front porch down for a third time that day. If there's anything that puts daggers in my eyes, it's too much dust on the front porch. But what am I to do? As far as the eye can see in any direction, that's all there is, pretty much. Dust and the parched white earth that flows like the sea itself all the way to the Sierra Madres, a week's ride to the north. To the south, east, and west, it's the same or worse. I may do, though, not complaining, not exactly. I'm all alone out here, and have been for a mighty long while now. I went back inside, then took stock of things. All I got here is this one big room and the loft up top where I make my bed. And there's a wood stove for heat in one corner and one for cooking, such as I do in the other. Not much more to speak of, really. Just an old sideboard, a few books, and that wobbly table and some chairs. I shook the dust off myself and set the pot on the fire for coffee. Then I sat down and put my feet up. That was always nice. Nobody to raise an eye or squawk when I'm not doing what they think I should be doing. Whatever the hell that might be. No, it's good living out here all alone. All by myself. Just me and the dust. The only person who ever comes this far out from town, a good day's hard ride or more, is the sheriff, Roy Varick. A good man, looks in on me from time to time, and even gives me odd work a couple three times a month to help me make ends meet. Good old Roy. Then I got the prickle up the backside of the nape of my neck. Riders coming. I went back out front and stood on the porch. 
I could barely see that rising swirl of white dust still a good hour away. Good thing I'd put that coffee on. I figured it was Roy, so there'd be work. I could tell too much dust just for one horse. Had to be two. Roy's and the other one. I smiled. Good to know I'd be able to make ends meet this month. So I sat back down in the rocker on my front porch and settled in to wait, wondering what Roy would have for me this time. When the horses finally pulled up to the house, I could see they'd been ridden pretty hard. Roy looked beat tired and the other one weren't much more than a boy, but already hard, cold and twisted mean inside, without remorse on what he had done. It was always a shame to see that, you know, in one so young, but it just couldn't be helped sometimes. Jacob, Roy said, tipping his hat and grinning as he jumped down off that big palomino of his. He tied the horses and then dragged the other, cuffed feet and hands and mouth gagged, onto the ground and then dragged them to his feet. Roy, I said, waiting to hear more. You got coffee? Always. Just made it as it happens just for you, Roy. He snorted and nodded his gratitude as he took his hat and slapped the dust off himself and the kid. I'll take the horses out back and get them watered and cooled down. You go on inside, help yourself. There's bread on the sideboard and some bacon that might still be good. Much blood, sir, he said, and I could hear in his voice he was tired. And something more, angry maybe, more than usual. I chuckled, thinking on that mouth gag. Kid must have been yapping at the mouth. Roy didn't like that kind of thing. He always was a quiet man, a thinking man to be sure, but kept most of it close to his chest like a hand of cards. I got the horses watered and put them in the barn with a bag of oats, a gift from Roy last time or the time before when he had came out my way. I could see they was pleased, such fine beautiful beasts as they were too. Raised Palomino and the other, a fine bay filly with a full white blaze. I stood there a bit, rubbing my hand along their backs, them nickering all the while and nuzzling my neck. I've always had a way with animals. They like me, and I like them. It was the other ones, like that boy in there that I had other feelings on. I see you found everything, I said, getting back inside, smiling with satisfaction at the easy comfort Roy showed in my house, helping himself to what was there and knowing without asking where everything was hid. Yes, sir. And you be well, I suppose? Oh, yeah, you know me, Roy, always the same. What's the change out here? You need anything, you let me know now. Here? Everything's fine. But what you got here? I asked, gesturing with the shake of my head at the boy who sat sullenly, still cuffed hand and foot at the table. The gag had been removed and the boy glowered at me while he sipped his coffee and stuffed cake in his mouth like he hadn't eaten in a week. What we doing out here, old Roy? Where you taking me? The kid bellowed, rising up half out of his seat like there was some place to go. Well, Johnny... You see, it's like this, Roy began, tossing me a glance and cracking his knuckles and flexing them before knocking the kid back into his chair. <coughs> I only got two cells in my jail and they're full up, so I got to stash you someplace. Them other two, hell, we got proper trials all set up for those boys. Their path is clear. Well, we got witnesses to their misdeeds. We got confessions, all cut, dried, and sewed up neat as a pen. But you, Johnny, well, we got nothing concrete to go on. Nothing that makes you good for all them other murders. Just that we know you did it. You know how you can just tell? How you can read it on the man like it was tattooed across his forehead? So we don't know what to do with you. Figured it was easier to stash you out here to Jacob's place a million miles from nowhere. Just put you on ice, so to speak, until we can figure things out. Or you decide to grow a pair and own up to your misdeeds and take your justice like a man, Roy said, swirling his coffee and watching the ground settle. Well, that 
That's plain crazy, Sheriff, the kid bellowed. You mean to just leave me out here with this old codger? Roy yelled like a stuck pig, then calmed himself and looked at the kid, shaking his head the while. Jacob ain't no codger, son, but I best be getting back. I started before sun up and I'll ride through most of night. Oh, thank you, Jacob. I'll be back in a few days to check on things. He added, slapping his hat back on his head and gathering up the package of food I'd set aside for him for the trail. Then he was out the door and closed it firm behind him. The sound of the iron bar dropping down over that door made the kid almost jump out of his hide. What the hell? You, you mean we's locked in here? Speck so, I said, refilling my coffee cup. You want any? No. I warn you now, old man. I'm gonna bust out of here. You got horses out back? No, no horses here. And Roy took the one he rode in on back to town with him. No way out of here. And it's a day's ride to town, as you saw. And twice that or more the other way as far to anything worth getting to. You may as well get used to it. Johnny, is it? You're stuck here, I said, and the kid stomped his cuffed feet in rage. <coughs> but no reason why we can't pass the time. Why don't you tell me about yourself? I said, grinning and trying to be friendly. We got three days till Roy comes back and nothing to do but get to know each other a bit. Or you can sit there and sulk in silence, thinking back on the deeds that got you here. Your call, Johnny. You let me know what you decide, I said, tinkering around in my kitchen, such as it was, cleaning up. But you're locked in here same as me, he yelled out. Why'd you let him do that? Ain't you afraid? No, I ain't afraid, I said, and it was the truth. Well, you got water in here? Water for three days for the two of us and all our needs? The kid added, blanching with the realization. Don't you worry. I got water in here from my well out back. Damn good well, too, and a miracle if you ask me. Sweetest water you ever tasted. Oh, hell, he groaned. Okay, so what's your story then? You first, being the guest here, I said. After all, this was my job looking after these folks Roy brought to me, and I take my job seriously doing the best I can. I saw the kid trying the handcuffs under the table, seeing if with a little wiggling and a bit of pain he could pull himself free. I shook my head. It was always this way. No use, Johnny. Best get talking. Why don't you start by telling me why you're here? What did they say you did? Said I killed me nine on fifteen people. Some of them nothing but damn kids. He snorted. And it was hard to tell if it was with revulsion or something else. Something more akin to pride, maybe. All at once or, you know, like one at a time. One at a time, of course, he bellowed and looked at me like I was a damned fool. Well, did you? I pressed, but he just glared at me. No, he muttered under his breath after a long pause. He still refused to look at me, but his breath picked up a bit and he opened his mouth and licked his lips, and I smiled. Tell me, Johnny, I said, my voice dropping almost to a whisper. You get the blood urge, don't you? Comes on you all at once. No warning or nothing. Am I right? I asked, my voice now low and kind of conspiratorial in its tone. He shot me a glance like he was a scared rabbit in a sprung trap. I... I... No! He hissed, but it had a hollow ring to it, like he didn't quite mean it. Yes, I said, grinning. I can see it on you, boy. You're not like other folks, and they'll never understand that, am I right? Well, maybe you got that right. Not even my ma and pa wanted anything to do with me after a while. I'd seen pa kill chickens a hundred times, but when I did it, well, they threw me out. I was just trying to help damn them. Said I enjoyed it too much. Can you imagine such a thing? He replied, <laughs> pounding the table with his cuffed fists. I understand, Johnny. Damn fools. They should have let you be. 
Set you up butchering cows and such so you could put your skills to doing a man's work. Useful work. And not have to move beyond, you know? Johnny smiled at me like he was just a tyke and I was his pappy. All trusting like. I understood him all right. First time in his life somebody understood him. And saw him for what he was. He killed because he had a need. A need he just couldn't put aside. So tell me about them girls then. And the other ones too. How many was there? I asked, like I was inquiring how many taters was left in the sack. Well, if you're sure, old man, Johnny said, his voice all meek now for the first time. I'm sure, son. Go ahead. It'll do you good to get it off your chest to someone who understands, who knows what you're going through, I said, nodding my head and encouraging him. Well, okay. See, okay, so there was 19, all told. From the beginning, he said, licking his lips again and taking a big gulp of air. And the first time, I was in Dandy's place all night, staggering home pissed drunk when I saw this open window, curtains flapping in the breeze, and this little angel sleeping in her bed. Before I knew what had come over me, I was back home in my bunk, blood on my hands and clothes soaked in it, and my head pounding and ready to bust wide open. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said softly. Go on. Well, it only took a day before I figured out what happened, hearing the outrage and chatter in town over it. But nobody suspected me, so I breathed a sigh of relief. I'd gotten away with it. I'd gotten clean away with it. And nobody was the wiser. So I hightailed it out of there, Johnny said, grinning like a kid on Christmas Eve. I see. Yeah, that sounds about right. I've heard this kind of thing before. Folks like you seem pretty natural in a way. When you look at it like that, you do what comes natural, just like anybody would. Yes, sir. So after that, it just got easier and easier. I went on for a good two, three years and more like that, going from town to town and moving on, keeping myself low and quiet like, coming into town after dark so nobody would know me enough to put things together. I'd just do my business and then ride out. Then what happened, Johnny? Then I come across this accursed town where your pal, old Sheriff Roy Varick, had been keeping tabs on the killings, and even had himself a big old map with pins stuck in all the spots where they'd been killings. All the places I'd passed through. I figured maybe he must have been waiting for me. Sure he was, waiting for whoever I happened to be. I hadn't been to that town yet. But when I got there, they had some posse set up, and all the houses where there was kids, widows, or some broken-down old geezer on his own had themselves some guardian angel with a Winchester on his knee aimed at the window, sitting vigil till sunup. That night I came into town after dark, as was my custom. I figured I'd do my business and be gone before anybody had ever laid eyes on me. But no, that was just not to be. As soon as I crawled in that window, I was grabbed by the neck and slammed to the floor like a calf on Brandon Day with the butt of a rifle to the head, and then dragged half senseless to the sheriff. But it was strange. He didn't even arrest me, didn't charge me with nothing, didn't even ask about any crimes. Just gagged me and cuffed me to this outhouse where I lay like a dog in the mud the rest of the night. He had me, sure. I suppose he did. But he never did arrest me or try to prove nothing. And the next morning we lit out for here, and I got no damn idea why. Well, you got to pay for your crimes, Johnny, one way or the other. The fact you set up a plan for the killing, you was real clever to set out that way not to get caught. That shows you got no shame in your deeds. You know that, right? I said. No, no I don't. Hell no I don't. It's just my way. You're right about that. The way I see it, though, old Sheriff Roy wasn't so smart after all. What the hell made him bring me out here, guarded by some old geezer? I ain't staying put here. You gotta see that. And beg your pardon for saying, you got that fine Winchester sitting right there. I see it. But I'm a third your age, and even with these cuffs on, I can put you down before you can even make a go for it. I don't want to hurt you. You've been awful nice to me, all things considered. But I mean to have my freedom at all costs. He sat there for a moment, 
like he thought we was at some kind of stalemate. Johnny, didn't you tell me Roy never arrested you? Never took nothing down on you, not even your name? Nothing? That's right. Damn sloppy fool by my reckoning. No, I said with a whisper, and not without a drop of pity. Roy's no fool, and he's never known a sloppy minute in his life. Now here's the thing you gotta understand. Roy and me, we got this arrangement, see? I ain't got much out here, and frankly, I don't need much to keep me going. Just a little bit to make ends meet each month, besides the few taters I grow out back and my chickens. So Roy, he brings me work now and then. Work he can't rightly handle on his own in town through the usual means. And it helps me to make ends meet, as I say, I explained, smiling and feeling that delicious tingle in my body clear down to my toes whenever I start going my way. It was beginning, sure enough, and soon Johnny would see exactly what I meant. My body started stretching out long, getting longer and longer, faster and faster. Then my head burst into that horned and fanged crown that was my glory, and my feet did the same and popped the head of the like out of them too. And there I was, all twenty feet of my magnificent two-headed scaled and dripping gourmet splendor of hunger. Johnny started screaming, but hell, I figured he'd gone mad long before I even turned to look at him, vomiting on himself and filling the air with his stink. Then I spun around, two heads coming together onto Johnny's body in the middle, making ends meet and taking him whole in one gulp and tearing him clean in two and gobbling him down, each mouth getting its fair share. The blood flowed everywhere, thick and sweet, and it was so very, very good. I couldn't rightly decide and never could, really, which I found more to my liking in these boys. All that blood, or the look of fear and something else when they looked into my eyes, you know, toward the end, and only saw their own face looking back at them in my black eyes, reminding them of what they had done to all those other folks who had never done them a lick of harm. I finished that boy off and then licked myself clean and curled up in a coil on the kitchen floor and took a long nap, which was my way. Plenty of time to sleep through tomorrow even, and plenty of time before Sheriff Roy come back to look in on me and see that I was all right. But then, he knew I would be. He's such a nice man, that Roy Varick, I thought to myself, smiling and drifting off into those dreams I get. Dreams of other things, and other places. Already a hunger building up in me for what Sheriff Roy Varick would bring out from town next time he came to call. Well, that one came full circle, didn't it? That was Making Ends Meet by author Aaron Vleck. A good reminder that there are better options for overcrowded prisons than bail reform. One way or another, you gotta pay for your crimes. A little about the author. Aaron Vleck is a storyteller whose work focuses primarily on the trickster, as bringer of delight and proponent of disquieting humors. Many of her short stories delve into the original tales of the djinn and a universal imagining of the Native American coyote. Some works are historical in setting, while others hail from the contemporary and urban landscape. She indulges more and more in the reimagining of classic themes of Lovecraftian horror and has a keen fondness for the occult detective. Erin is a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College, where she spent most of her time writing. I've got good news for you, friends. If you're interested in some more Erin Vleck, you can visit her at her website at erinvleck.wordpress.com. That's A-A-R-O-N-V-L-E-K dot wordpress dot com where she's got a number of stories you can listen to and even more at her podcast series the private collector which you can find on the wicked library dot com click on seasons and scroll down to the private collector check it out won't you more good news bodacious creed in the san francisco syndicate is just over half funded 
To view the Kickstarter page and a video I recorded for them, visit www.gbooks.biz, G-B-O-O-K-S dot B-I-Z. To hear the book I already recorded in the series, check out Bodacious Creed and The Jade Lake on audible.com. Once this new one is fully funded, guess who gets to narrate it? That's right, your pal. Let's make that happen. And as long as you're feeling generous, friends, subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and maybe a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. Again, it's probably a life or death decision, and you know I only want the best for you. And remember, we are accepting submissions. If you got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full and red carpet treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. I'm afraid the only way out of here is south, but I'd never send you home empty-handed. This week, I'd like to recognize Kenya. That's right, Kenya, for making me the number two podcast in the fiction category last time I had a look. I guess I'm good to listen to while you're marathon training. So, if there's no disagreement from anyone in attendance, here goes. May the wind be at your back. May the road rise up to meet you. May you never betray your fellow audiophiles. And above all, Quinda Kutomba Minweye. Thanks, Kenya. Oh yeah, to Big John, my new buddy from Leicester, England. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Good night, y'all.